Welcome to part two of our pediatric ophthalmology question and answer seminar. Uh, I'm a pediatric ophthalmologist doing uh, pediatrics and adult strabismus at Indiana University in the United States. I am also a longtime Orbis volunteer faculty member, most recently in Ethiopia. Uh, and I am also a consultant to Orbis uh, with our telemedicine and teleeducation. And on, on that note, I'd like to make everyone aware that we've just recently launched a uh, curriculum on phaco emulsification, which you can find in the CyberSight library. And this is uh, similar to our other blended learning multimedia uh, products that we've launched this past year, um, including the ophthalmic nursing, the pediatric ophthalmology and adult strabismus modules, and, um, and also the manual small incision cataract surgery modules that we have live there. So take a look at that, and I think you'll find that to be very interesting. Uh, our next product coming out will be the glaucoma uh, modules. Um, so today, we're going to do things maybe just a little bit different than we did last time. Last time, I had all of your questions in advance, and we went through those. And I'm still going to work through that list of the previously submitted questions. But in addition to that, I'll be monitoring uh, the chat feed and uh, question answers and um, or rather the question and answers, not the chat feed, but the question and answers. And I'll alternate with one of the pre-program questions um, with a live question uh, if we have one. And, and again, uh, uh, this time we'll stay as long as we have active questions. Uh, so uh, starters here, I'll go to the first leftover question from our last session, and then I'll I'll come into our question and answers. So you'll see me hesitate at times as I read through these submitted uh, questions and uh, find those that are appropriate for us to discuss. All right, so let me move on to sharing the screen here. Um, and this is a question that came in, in uh, I guess it was August when we did this last. And the question was, uh, this came from multiple sources. So you can see that uh, Similar question came from Romania, India, and Saudi Arabia. And the questions were, opinion on an isometropic amblyopia treatment in children 10 to 12 years of age, amblyopia treatment in children over 12 years old, and is amblyopia treatment useful in adults? So you can see these are all relatively similar. Well, in general, when you're talking about older children, um, particularly those that have never had treatment, I will always offer that to the families. Um, you know, I think it's good for everyone. Some of these kids will improve. Um, other times they won't improve, but at least you've given the family a, a, a shot at uh, feeling like they had a chance to make some improvement because a lot of times these families uh, may feel guilty that it was discovered too late. So I think it's always a good thing to try because um, you know, we always talk about seven years of age being kind of the cutoff for amblyopia treatment, but we all see that there's a lot of diversity. Some kids won't improve after age five. Uh, other kids will continue to improve uh, even when they're in the 10 to 12 or older age range. So yes, um, I always give it a go. Now, sometimes if people have been through extensive treatment for years already, and I feel like they've already had a good shot at it, I don't restart treatment or continue it in these older kids, uh, but definitely give it a go if, if they've never had treatment before. And then there's a question of adults. Adults, um, that's a little bit more difficult. And I think that the evidence to suggest that they would improve is pretty limited. And uh, personally, um, I don't treat amblyopia in adults, um, but uh, if that's something you want to try, there's not much downside to it other than just the inconvenience if it doesn't work. The um, uh, little summary slide of what we're just talking about, um, you know, the bottom section here talks about neuromodulators, so uh, L-dopa, levodopa, uh, and other substances. These are, these are um, medications that are thought to perhaps restore some plasticity to the neurologic system. And I have anecdotally had patients in, in my office who improved with L-DOPA therapy. And so for a while I had a lot of interest in, in that. And so these would be uh, children who were refractory to 
um, refractory to uh, refractory to ongoing treatment or patching or atropine, or these could be kids that are older and you're wanting to start treatment um, and increase their chances of improving, um, or it could even be adults with uh, L-DOPA therapy. And again, while I've had some improvement, uh, that hasn't always been borne out when, uh, when you start to do large multi-center studies. And there was actually a, a pedic study uh, the Pediatric Eye Disease Investigator Group uh, a few years ago, where they, where they actually randomized some of these um, um, levodopa patients. Uh, so these this group was, you can see it's older kids, the participants there, they were seven to 12 years of age with residual amblyopia. Moderate to severe, they were 2050 to 2400. And they were given the levodopa oral therapy three times a day uh, for about 16 weeks and monitored. The levodopa group did get better um, than the placebo group, but the difference was pretty small. So the levodopa group was improving by 5.2 letters, whereas the placebo group improved by 3.8. And when you break that down and look at it statistically, it just was not statistically significant but the, there were no adverse side effects uh, as has been my clinical experience. So there are some reports of levodopa being helpful and you may want to consider that, uh, but just keep in mind that the scientific evidence for it is not quite there uh, to fully endorse it. All right. All right, let me open up our QA before we go to our next question here. All right, uh, the first question this morning was um, from Dr. Ajmani. And what are the possible causes of sudden alternating esotropia in a three-year-old boy? Uh, I saw this case in which the father said that the boy developed alternating esotropia two hours back. So this is, um, this is something we see not too uncommonly. It always causes a little bit of distress to not only the family, but to us as physicians, because um, people start thinking about the worst case scenarios neurologically. <clears throat> I can tell you that um, I see this all the time and it's kind of this acquired non-refractive esotropia. And um, in the absence of anything abnormal like papilledema or uh, abduction deficits or other neurologic signs, I usually don't image these patients unless, unless there's something else um, prompting me to be worried about a neurologic cause. Uh, you see this and it's usually just idiopathic. Sometimes there's a familial history and you'll find some families where um, several people have had this acquired non-refractive esotropia, but uh, most of the time it's just it's just uh, unexplained. And um, I, think, I think the key things here are, is, you know, it doesn't fall into that neat category of uh, constant congenital strabismus, and it doesn't fall into that acquired refractive esotropia. If they have any hyperopic refractive error, I will try glasses, but usually these are kids that might be plus ones or plus 150s, and, uh, and you don't really expect that. Why does it happen so suddenly, I think is a fair question. And I don't know that, uh, that I have the definitive answer to that. Uh, but it seems like sometimes there's an event that just tips these kids over, they get sick, um, uh, and they just start crossing. Other times people will tell you that it's intermittent at first and becomes constant. Uh, um, but I think when you have something acute like that, uh, unless there's a neurologic sign, what I would just simply do is to monitor them. You can have cyclic esotropia also, but you would expect that uh, to resolve and return. Uh, those do usually become constant over time, so that would be a little bit different than this. Um, so I think in this particular case, uh, unless there was some other neurologic sign or papilledema or abduction deficit, I would just monitor the child 
and see them back in a couple of weeks and, uh, and uh, only do neuroimaging if, if there was something else that appeared to be going on. Uh, okay, let me go back to our next question that's been previously submitted. And this is about intermittent XT, which I think is a good question. Oops, go back. Surgical criteria, what is your surgical criteria and upper age limit in intermittent divergent squint or exotropia? And this question comes from India. Uh, so uh, number one, age limit, I really have no age limit when it comes to intermittent exotropia. Clearly, usually the patient population we see with this is age two to six. Um, that's usually when it presents in my clinic. And a lot of times we're making surgical decisions to treat kids before school starts. Um, but we frequently also see adults that have had this their whole life. Maybe they're still intermittent or be, maybe they've become manifest. It doesn't really matter to me. Um, because I think the results are the same. I think, well, I think the results are better if they're intermittent. Um, those that have become constant XTs, I think are harder to straighten out. I think they're harder to keep straight. Uh, they tend to have very large angles um, where you're sometimes getting into needing three muscles, four muscles, and they may or may not require, uh, they may or may not reacquire a full sensory status. So their stereopsis may continue to be off afterward. But how do I go about the intermittent XT patient? Well, regardless of age, I pretty much go about it the same way. In, uh, in children, um, I don't really care how far out someone drifts. Now, obviously, if they're drifting out five prism diopters, that's, that's uh, not really a surgical candidate. But people that are in this range of drifting uh, 16 to 45 XT, that number doesn't really matter so much in terms of my surgical decision. It tells me how much surgery I'm going to do, but it doesn't tell me whether or not I should do surgery. That decision to me is, is guided by several things. Um, one, how often does the family or the patient's teacher see it happen? If they only see it when they're tired, um, then there's probably not any real reason to operate. But if they're seeing it all throughout the day, uh, no matter what uh, the fatigue status is, well, then that's someone that's more likely to require surgery. Um, under what circumstances is it seen? Again, that's kind of the fatigue, non-fatigue question. Who sees it? Uh, if it's only the mother that sees it once in a while, you know, that's probably not, especially in someone that's two or three or four, that's probably not a surgical candidate. Um, but if everyone sees it and other kids are pointing it out, uh, other family members see it, teachers see it, again, that nudges you towards surgery. Are there symptoms? Well, a lot of times there are not symptoms, especially in kids. But of course, you see people, they'll have light sensitivity, they'll have squinting, they'll complain about depth perception, they'll complain about tripping. Um, sometimes they have symptoms of asthenopia or eye pain when they are reading. Um, so you can definitely have symptoms. Uh, adults uh, complain frequently about driving and uh, they'll alternate fixation and the, the road will shift from one side to another. I hear that complaint a lot. Diplopia, we don't really hear much of. So that's usually not an issue. Uh, diplopia um, is usually pretty transient when it happens. So, um, and sometimes it comes down to things like academic performance, people wanting to have exotropia fixed before kids get serious into uh, the beginning of um, first grade or so. Uh, or, you know, a lot of times, even if you're just doing things for cosmetic reasons, uh, this becomes an issue at around age five when, when children start to tease each other. My criteria are a little bit different for adults. Adults are very sensitive about this issue sometimes. And yeah, maybe it only happens when they're tired, but they feel like they're struggling to keep their eyes straight all day when they're having conversations with people. And if someone is really struggling with it that much, I think it's quite reasonable to do their surgery at a lower level than you would maybe for a four-year-old child. All right. Um, so it's pretty much everything other than the prism diopter measurement goes into factoring when I do surgery. 
and I do not have an upper age limit, and I do not see problems with diplopia in adults having this surgery unless you overcorrect them, right? As long as you leave them ortho or undercorrected, these people do fine. So no, up, no upper limits. All right, I'm going to go back to our live questions here. And oh, might do a couple here. Treatment of allergic con conjunctivitis, not responding well to um, tacrolimus. Uh, allergic conjunctivitis is always a tough one because uh, a lot of the over-counter remedies uh, are not really great. And even a lot of the uh, prescription medicines um, I've been kind of underwhelmed with, um, whether they're once a day or twice a day. So sometimes what it takes with these, um, uh, if I have severe, let's just, just talk about seasonal conjunctivitis, not uh, vernal and some of these other more difficult cases. Um, but I'll do a burst of topical steroids, fluoromethylone or prednisolone, and maybe do that for a uh, couple weeks while I'm also using a mast cell stabilizer. Um, whether that mast cell stabilizer is um, by itself or combined with an antihistamine because it generally takes a couple weeks for mast cell, stabili mast cell stabilizers to kick in. And, um, and so when you use a, a mast cell stabilizer, you have to caution the family, look, you, you have to use this every day uh, as directed. It's gonna take a couple weeks until you get the full effect. In the meantime, we'll supplement with the steroid, but then I want you to stop the steroid and not continue it uh, unless, unless you have my uh, instructions to do so. And um, usually when I handle it that way, um, most people will, will be controlled. You know, the main problem with uh, some of the mast cell stabilizers is that they, they have to be used a minimum of twice a day. And, um, and some of them have to be used four times a day. So it, it, it can be a, a challenge sometimes. Um, there's another question that I'm just going to acknowledge but not answer because I don't have a a good answer for you. Uh, question, um, and that previous question was from Dr. Amanda. This question is from Dr. Dash, and Dr. Dash has a question, how effective is citicoline in the treatment of amblyopia? If yes, then how should it be prescribed? And, and frankly, I don't have any experience using citicoline for amblyopia. Um, pretty much my amblyopia treatment has been restricted to occlusion patching, atropine penalization, which I'm a big fan of if, if the patient has some hyperopia, and then um, supplementing some of that with, uh, with the uh, L-DOPA as needed. Uh, but citicoline, I don't have any experience with, sorry. Um, I can see if I can find an answer because now I'm curious. Um, all right, so I'll go back to our um, previously submitted questions again. And I think this is a good one. This is one that comes up frequently uh, when I travel working overseas as well as when I'm working with fellows in my institution. How do you calculate the intraocular lens power for a three-year-old and a five-year-old child? Well, uh, yeah, obviously when you're talking intraocular lens powers in, in this age group, uh, there's going to be a variety of opinions. Uh, first of all, you have to decide can you put an intraocular lens in? And in an infant or someone with a small cornea less than 10 millimeters, um, PHPB cases, nanophthalmus, you may not be able to do an intraocular lens. But in this age group, three to five, presumably you have an eye that's large enough. And um, so then you have to decide what, what post-operative refractive error do I want there to be? And in a three to five year old, there are two schools of thought. Some people would say you still target emetropia, Plano, just like you would in an adult, and that that will facilitate your amblyopia treatment because even if they don't have glasses, the eye's in focus. Um, that is generally not how I do it, um, nor is it how most uh, pediatric ophthalmologists in the United States, at least, uh, do it. Um, you will find places overseas uh, in, in Europe um, 
uh, some people I know um, target Plano still. But generally, the school of thought here uh, that I prefer is leaving some residual hyperopia so that as the patient grows and ages, that you'll be closer to what their adult refractive error should be so that you do not need to do an intraocular lens exchange. You do not need to do refractive surgery. You just have something that's in the ballpark of what they would have needed if they were 20 years old. And I'll show you a chart about how I come about with that. Um, so, but that's in the ideal circumstance, targeting residual hyperopia. Uh, that's when you have easy access to glasses. Maybe you have temporary access to a contact lens if you're not close enough. Um, and, and assuming that you're going to be able to keep that patient in glasses um, the whole time while they're growing until they kind of emetropize. The, uh, when I do target residual hyperopia, I am going roughly on these guidelines. Uh, these, are, these are taken from uh, what I think is the best book on pediatric cataract surgery, which is written by Ed Wilson and uh, Rupal Trevetti. And it is a pediatric uh, cataract surgery, Atlas of Pediatric Cataract Surgery, I think it is. Um, and a lot of our um, cyber site library content in the pediatric ophthalmology module, the section that's on pediatric cataract surgery has this table and much of it's taken from that text, um, which was prepared with the help of Ed Wilson, uh, along with uh, my authorship. And I think that, you know, these, this table is, has not ever been presented as what you should do. And I think Ed Wilson would be quick to tell you, this is not this is not a, like a surgical guideline for strabismus, but I think these are good rough estimates of what, what I practice and, and target with, with my lens implantations. And I do lens implantations all the way down to infancy um, in some monocular cases. And then um, pretty much always in binocular cases over age one. Uh, for starters, I usually use the holiday one formula. Um, I think the holiday one, um, um, or perhaps the SRKT are pretty good formulas. The um, Hoffer Q, is, if you have a small eye in particular, it may have some advantages, but I, as a general go-to holiday, one is the formula that I use. Um, and then what do I target? So in an infant um, here, let's just say this is a three month old, Usually with an infant, if I'm putting in a unilateral IOL, I'll go in this ballpark of plus eight. Um, and that's, you can see the intraocular lens power, it's usually required in an infant like that. Um, it might be a plus 28 to a plus 32 to obtain that kind of hyperopic refractive error. Uh, now in an infant like that, if you've got plus eight, you're gonna need to do something temporary to keep that eye in focus if that's their targeted refractive air when they, um, during their post-op visits. Um, so this is where you're either gonna have to do glasses with a plus eight on one side, which may not be a big deal because a lot of these kids are gonna be plus four in the other eye, plus three in the other eye. Or you might do a temporary contact lens until that hyperopia has melted away, which happens pretty fast. Because you can see here in a, say at this 0.5 in a six month old, I'll be targeting something down here, closer to a six, eh, six, six and a half. And then a one year old, uh, plus five is usually a pretty good target. Um, so you see that the hyperopia is melting away quite quickly. And as you get in here to kind of our more common age and the age that this um, uh, question refers to, question was about a in a three-year-old, if you're doing cataract surgery, what do you target? And I think that this is a pretty good number, plus three. There'll be plus three. Um, you can do uh, in the one eye or in both eyes. You can do glasses to uh, equalize an isometropia. And within just a few years, their hyperopia is going to be gone, and you're going to be in the ballpark of Plano as they continue to grow. Uh, the second patient in this question was a five-year-old. So a five-year-old right here between our four and six. And you can see in a five-year-old, we might be targeting about plus two. 
and then eight year old plus one. So, so really, uh, by the time you're getting to, uh, to a teenager or a, a 10, 11, 12 year old, you, you, you pretty much just targeting like you would normally for an adult, uh, close to emetropia, uh, maybe a little trace of hyperopia or a little myopia, but it's basically emetropia. All right. Um, and that's generally how I do it. Now, if you want to see that chart, then again, go to CyberSight Library, find the full pediatric ophthalmology um, uh, module, and then cataract is part three of that module, and that chart will be in there as well as with other guidelines, things like where do you make a parse plane and incision if you're doing a primary posterior capsulotomy, ways to manage the anterior capsule, um, all the things that are different about pediatric cataract surgery, because clearly uh, this is not uh, just doing small eyes and small people. All right, so back to our um, uh, previously submitted questions. Or I'm sorry, let's take a live question here. This is from uh, uh, my, my buddy, Dr. Farah. Um, dose of penalization on four-year-old who has moderate amblyopia with retinoscopy of minus 650 in the right eye, and then the left eye is a minus 150. Uh, so we have an isometropic myopia in this case with a best corrected, uh, it also has intermittent XT and has a best corrected acuity of um, 624 in the right eye and 69 in the left eye. So at four years of age with relatively dense amblyopia, um, um, the fact that it's from myopia rather than uh, hyperopia doesn't make much difference other than the fact that it takes them out of the atropine category, okay? This, this is a good case where you would not respond to atropine, so that's off the chart. So we're talking about occlusion therapy. And for a patient like this and a four-year-old, I think you have to be relatively aggressive. They have dense amblyopia, and their plasticity period where they're gonna respond to treatment is pretty minimal, or it's pretty short. It may be a year, maybe less. So, you know, I think this is one case where maybe trying full-time occlusion or, or close to it, maybe leave them unoccluded a couple hours a day and start off by doing that for, um, for a month or two. Uh, I'd probably start do it for a month and see them back and see if you can get them jump started because um, uh, otherwise you you might just be doing four hours a day, six hours a day, and they may respond, but it's going to be gradual. And you may lose some of that um, time, that treatment time that you have because they're already four years of age. So I think one of two ways to go about this, either start patching them four to six hours a day and just do that consistently until they get better vision to where you could drop it down to two hours a day. And by better vision, to me, that's uh, when they start to get in the 20, 40, 20, 50, 20, 60 range. When they get into that range, then I might switch to two hours a day. So starting off at four to six and then tapering down as they improve or trying to jumpstart them with some full-time occlusion all but one hour a day and do that for a month uh, to get them jumpstarted and see where they are. Now, if they haven't been in glasses, I uh, probably would just put them in glasses with no patching and see them back in about four weeks and see how much better they are just with the, uh, just with the optical correction. So uh, in general, that is what I will do. I will give, if people are not in optical correction yet, I will give them glasses and then I will um, um, start patching at the next visit. And unless I think time is of the, uh, of the issue, okay? All right, uh, back to our next previously submitted question. All right, uh, this is a good one. Strategies and methods to follow various degrees of ectopia lentis, and this is from a physician in India. Well, I think the strategies and methods depend on how much ectopia lentis. 
And what do I mean by that? Well, if the lens is mild to moderately decentered, so you can see just a little bit of zonules at the edge of the pupil, for instance, undilated. All right, so that lens is mild to moderately decentered. Then most of those kids I will treat with just a very careful refraction. What do you expect to find? You expect to find uh, moderate myopia with uh, moderate astigmatism along the axis in, in plus cylinder, along the axis of displacement of the lens. Uh, so a lot of times you can manage those that way. Now, if you have moderate luxation of the lens, so now you're seeing maybe a third, a third of the um, pupil is filled with, it's aphagic and it's filled with zonules. And then two thirds of the pupil is subluxated lens. Well, let's just go to the whiteboard here so we can diagram that. Because I think these are the ones that we most commonly see. All right, uh, get all my stuff out of the way, make some room. Okay, so most commonly, we're going to see a pupil like this. Lens is here, and we've got zonules coming out. All right. And this is a horrible drawing because I'm doing it with the trackpad. Sorry about that. Um, so the lens, right, this is all the lens. This is, looks like a third grader drew it. All right, so what do I do? Right, you have two options in this kind of moderate subluxation. One, you can still, you can still refract through the lens. All right, you're going to have more myopia, more stigmatism, and, and these, are the, these are the refractions that start to look like minus 10, uh, plus five, stuff like that. Mm, still kind of crummy vision. So a lot of times refracting through the lens doesn't work out very well. You do it and then their acuity is still not good. So another option is keep them dilated. So make their pupil bigger with atropine twice a day. And now, lens is there. Now you've got all this aphakic area here. And you may just do an aphakic spherical refraction through this zone rather than refracting through the lens. So in someone who is not a surgical candidate or is not ready for surgery or can't afford surgery or Maybe they have asymmetric luxation and one eye is ready for surgery and one eye is not. Um, this is something you can do. Uh, just so now, instead of giving them through the lens minus 10 plus five, now you can refract them through the aphakic area and maybe you're just giving them plus 15 spherical lens. So that's another great trick for managing these uh, lens subluxations. Um, now, when you get more significant degrees of luxation and the lens, the lens now is, uh, say, um, the lens is now halfway across or more, uh, these are the ones that uh, uh, when you get that much subluxation, you can still do the aphakic refraction and, and just leave the lens subluxated. But more commonly, this is when we're removing the lens. And I like to do that with a vitrector. Uh, and that's also a technique that you can find in the pediatric cataract surgery module. But a vitrector for removing a subluxated lens is a great tool. And I tend to do that with, um, um, it's not an intracapsular technique because we open the, the capsule. But you make a small opening in the lens with the vitrector, put the vitrector inside the lens, and then using aspiration only, you will, um, you'll go ahead and suck out the lens until the bag is empty and, and then turn the vitrector on and take the bag out now and now they're aphagic. Okay, so uh, when I do that, um, I will usually then just do aphagic spectacles or um, aphagic contact lens. 
Uh, I am an investigator on the Artisan IOL, um, uh, the Iris Claw lens, uh, which in the, at least in the U.S. is still being implanted uh, only under investigational um, studies. Uh, in Europe, it's uh, it's uh, not investigational and it's done routinely. And this seems to be a pretty nice device for uh, for correcting these subluxated aphakic uh, patients, um, whether it's from subluxated lenses or trauma or complicated cataract surgery, uh, people seem to do really well with this. Um, so that would probably be the next, the, the, the other good option. The third option, which is a suture fixated IOL, uh, I do that occasionally. I don't like doing it in really young kids, um, would not be a big fan of doing that bilaterally. Um, you know, the thing with those, the thing with a suture fixated lens is that even if you use a heavier suture, like a 9.0 proline, it's not a matter of, is it going to break? It's, it's a matter of when is it going to break? So, um, if you, if you do a suture fixated IOL in a child with a luxated lens, I, I think that everyone has to have a clear understanding that there are some significant risks with breakage and it's probably gonna to have to be redone. Maybe you get 10 years out of it, maybe you don't. Um, but if you have a six-year-old and that lens is gonna last six years, you're talking about re-suture fixating a lens um, six, seven, eight times. Uh, I think that's maybe not the best option when a fake glasses would probably not be the best thing, but they would work fine. Um, even if you can't get contact lenses, uh, the glasses work fine as long as you can replace them. Um, so suture fixated IOL, lowest on my list there. All right. And I'll go back. Let's look at our question answers here. All right. I think this is from uh, Vietnam, Dr. An. Uh, do amblyopia treatments affect deviation when patients have strabismus combined with... Uh, Amblyopia. That's uh, a good question. Okay, so uh, the question is, do ambly does amblyopia treatment affect alignment when you have strabismic amblyopia? Uh, the answer is maybe. I, I don't feel like I see a lot of variability in that, um, but I think it's always best practice to treat the amblyopia first. Uh, for a couple of reasons. Um, let's take one, let's, let's go through a couple scenarios here. Uh, congenital esotropia. So they've got 40 prism diopters of esotropia and they have uh, a fixation preference or amblyopia. If you treat their amblyopia before surgery, you can easily tell which eye they're fixating with. So it's very easy to guide your patching uh, and get them um, equal or as close to equal as you can get. Once you straighten that infant's eyes though, it's really difficult to tell which eye they're fixating with. So you may not have a firm handle on their amblyopia treatment until they become verbal and you can test acuities. So for that reason, I think it's important to do your amblyopia treatment first and then do your surgery, especially since the timing of surgery doesn't seem to make a huge difference from a sensory standpoint. And, um, you know, uh, and also from an anesthesia standpoint, it's probably more safety uh, as they get a little bit older. Uh, and I've not seen that change their strabismus deviations. Okay. If they have 40 XT, they're going to still have 40 XT. Uh, where, where I think it could change uh, your uh, alignment um, measurements is uh, in exotropia or especially intermittent exotropia. Uh, so, uh, so again, I think it's important to maybe treat the, if there is intermittent XT or constant XT um, with amblyopia, then I would probably want to treat their amblyopia first because that could affect um, maybe not so much their degree, how far out do they deviate the prism measurements, but it's probably going to affect whether or not they need surgery uh, in terms of intermittency. More dense amblyopia is gonna to tend to be a more constant or frequent XT. Less dense amblyopia is probably gonna be less constant. 
uh, with refractive esotropia. A lot of times um, I, I do these kind of concurrently. I'll start their amblyopia treatment, and then if, if they have a manifest strabismus while they're in the glasses, um, I'll, I'll go ahead and book their surgery also. And because a lot of times these kids are a little bit older, and I think time is of the essence. Uh, a lot of these refractive ETs, they're going to be three, four, five. Uh, it's not uncommon. They get them when they're five years old and they're doing some kind of a preschool exam. So you have a five-year-old with refractive ET or an, um, uh, and manifest or business. Um, I think that once you get their eyes straight, that's also going to facilitate their amblyopia treatment by having them be able to use the eyes at the same time. Um, so yes, the, the bottom line here is in general, treat the amblyopia first unless time is of the essence and you feel like you need to do both concurrently, in particular with refractive ET. Okay. Um, I'll take another live question here because it's, it's related. Uh, this is from Dr. Bengoa. And uh, his question is, can you, can you tell us about the current patching protocol for amblyopia? Any available web source for stereopsis uh, stimulations? Um, all right, so uh, online sources for stimulating stereopsis. Um, I don't, I don't have any that I use. Uh, I, I know there are multiple ones out there, but I think the evidence to support um, online use of, of um, stereopsis software is soft. And so it's not a part of, of my practice. Uh, you may want to check the, the PDIG, Pediatric uh, Eye Disease Investigator Group website um, to see if they have anything listed. Um, you know, in general, the results of stereopsis uh, video games, uh, and there was a recent PDIG study on this, um, it was kind of a wash. It didn't really seem to make much difference. So um, as far as patching protocols go, um, I tend to follow, I used to be a pretty aggressive patcher, um, patching six to eight to full time uh, hours every day. Um, I, I do admit that I've uh, decreased my patching intensity following the uh, PEDIC studies, um, at least for mild to moderate amblyopia. So the, the PEDIC study for mild to moderate amblyopia, and again, this is like uh, better than 2060, I think was the criteria, showed that two hours a day was equivalent to um, four to six hours a day, or it was equivalent to six hours a day, I believe it was. So I did decrease my patching after that. But it's not, it's not a uniform rule because there are exceptions to this. If, if I have uh, questions about compliance, I may recommend heavier doses of patching if I think that they're just doing half of what I give them. Uh, conversely, you have to be careful about that because if you tell them six hours a day and they just think that's impossible, maybe they'll do none. Um, but if they're willing to do one or two hours, then take that and maybe you can increase it, it once you kind of get them on board. Um, so for me, mild to moderate amblyopia is two hours a day. Uh, and you get into more severe amblyopia, uh, 2080 to 2400, 2200. Uh, this is when I really will try to get them to do all but one hour a day. Um, problem is if they're school age, like they're a five-year-old, you're not going to be able to do that. And so a lot of times I find myself doing full-time after school with these uh, moderate to dense amblyopes. Um, in infants, uh, it's a little bit different. So uh, infant cataracts would be a prime example. Infant cataracts, I will patch about one hour a day for every month old that they are. So a four month old would patch four hours a day. And uh, I cap that at half of all waking hours. So with, with infants, I'm kind of capping it anywhere from two to six hours a day in general. Um, and so, but most commonly I'm doing that again for, uh, uh, infant cataract surgeries. All right. And uh, let me go back to our previously submitted questions, and then we'll come back to the live questions.
All right, this one came in, and uh, this is from Peru, Guidelines for the Management of VKH, uh, Voight Kayanaki Harada Disease in Children. And I have to admit, I don't have much experience with this, uh, but after the question came in, I, I did go through the, this is from Peru, I did go through the literature and see what I could find um, to at least give you some um, input on this. Uh, it's not real common in the, the uveitic population in the United States, okay? The VKH is way more common in uh, countries that have people of Asian descent. Um, so um, it's also not real common in pediatric age groups. So uh, most common in adults 20 to 50, rare in children, less than 1% of pediatric uveitis in general. Uh, how do these people pre present? Um, conjunctival hyperemia, anterior chamber, cell and flare, serous retinal detachments and papillitis. I think those are the big hallmarks that you're looking for when you're trying to decide does someone have VKH. If you have uh, uveitis and a serous retinal detachment or uh, papillitis, then uh, be strongly suspicious. Uh, these patients can also get aseptic meningitis, deafness. Poliosis is the class, of course, one of the classic hallmarks, which is the whitening of the eyelashes and then the skin vitiligo. So uh, a lot of times this uh, shows up more in people with more pigmentation. So um, African descent, Asian descent, uh, you can a lot of times see the vitiligo more easily. Basically, uh, no, no real tricks here to answer your question, uh, but it seemed to be that uh, IV pulse steroids, methylprednisolone for several days, followed by oral prednisone for several months uh, was kind of the mainstay of treatment. If someone could not be controlled by oral prednisone um, for a few months, then, then, I, then you start to look at systemic medications other than prednisone. So... I think at this point you would want to involve a rheumatologist or an internal medicine specialist or a pediatrician because you're going to have to start looking at things like methotrexate or the uh, uh, anti-tumor necrosis um, uh, chemotherapy factors, um, just like with juvenile idiopathic arthritis. You're going to have to look at other systemic medications. All right, so um, that's my input for, for what it's worth. Uh, let's go back to our live questions. And uh, what is your suggestion? This is from uh, uh, Dr. Anonymous. Uh, what is your suggestion for intermittent exotropia with high ACA ratio? So intermittent exotropia with high ACA ratio. I'm trying to think if I see this very often. Uh, yeah, you see, I see this in young kids mostly. Um, thinking of when intermittent XT first starts, uh, I see this in like three-year-olds. And what does this look like? Okay, so there'll be manifest XT at distance. And then at near totally ortho or, or uh, they have a, a foria. Um, what do I do? Well, I try not to operate on these people. Um, especially with the young ones like that when they're, when they're three. If I, if I see a three-year-old that has this, um, I'll just monitor them. I don't, I don't do anything. Just see them back in a few months and, and monitor. Wait till their near control starts to break down. Uh, because this is safe. Even though they are manifest at distance, it doesn't matter. Because they're, they have good control at near, therefore they're not going to lose stereopsis they are not going to get amblyopia. So you can wait on that forever. So don't worry about it. Don't let that affect your decision. Wait till they get older and wait till they get decompensate because they will. They, they won't stay this high ACA ratio forever. Um, what about an older child or an adult? Um, let's think, uh, teenagers. Uh, so an older, let's go, let's just say an eight year old now, someone who's in school eight years old to um, 18. Um, well, it's a bit of a problem. I don't worry about as much 
as I do the kids who are of amblyopia sensitive age, because what you worry about in these patients is that you might overcorrect them at near and give them diplopia at near or cause suppression at near. So that's why I wouldn't want to operate on a three-year-old because all of a sudden you have something that's not causing amblyopia to something that is. Uh, but an 18 year old or an eight year old, they're not going to get amblyopia. So they may have some transient diplopia or permanent diplopia, but they won't, um, they won't have their vision damaged by that. Um, I prefer that they, um, that they still um, break down a little bit. One thing you can do, whether it's in children or adults, is do a patch occlusion test. If you're examining them and they manifest at distance, but they have like a foria at near, put a patch over one eye and leave it on for about 10 minutes. Uh, once that, come back and, and try and break them down. And if you can start to bring out a little more near deviation, then that makes it a little more um, reassuring when you want to do surgery. However, if they stay totally ortho at near and you're going to operate or, or maybe they have a very small near deviation, I think you have to be a little bit cautious and I would just back off my distance numbers. If, um, so say they're 40 at distance, but they're only 15 at near. Uh, I think you still wanna do a pretty healthy dose to get their distance under control, but you might consider uh, doing less, uh, less surgery for their near deviation and you might stick with lateral rectus recessions rather than a recess resect where the strengthening in the medial could, could make them more ET at near. So patch occlusion to wear them down or bring them back later, later in the day when they're tired um, to see if you can diminish the high ACA ratio. And if the high ACA ratio doesn't diminish, then maybe just being conservative on your surgical dose. And that would be about all I do. Um, uh, I, I see one le question live here um, that I'll just answer now, and that is because uh, it has to do with something we just talked about a minute ago, and this is from Dr. Gordon. Why is the artisan lens still on trial in the United States? Well, it's still on trial because uh, it has to go through FDA uh, approval for use in pediatric age groups. All right, so... Um, just because it's approved in Europe doesn't make it automatically approved in the United States. And in the United States, uh, there is a different approval process for using uh, devices in adults or medications in adults uh, versus children. So it is still undergoing um, FDA trials, I think, for both adults and children. Uh, that study is being done simultaneously. You have to get certain numbers done, and then they have to be followed for a certain period of time to get specular microscopy, et cetera. It just takes time. Um, so it, they'll be through the approval process within a, a couple of years. Um, but until then, it's, it's all being done under investigational device protocols, which is fine. You don't want to just start doing these things and find out that people are losing endothelial cells. So um, it's available, but you just have to be in the study. And you can, if you get one study eye done, you can have it done in the other eye um, um, that's not part of the study, right? So that's where it stands right now. All right, uh, back to our previously submitted questions after BKH. All right, and this is a good one. What is your stepwise approach to infants with congenital glaucoma and cataract? Because we see this a lot. We see an a, a infant that has both cataract and glaucoma. And specifically, to make it even more fun, uh, their corneas are too cloudy for goniotomy. This is from Zimbabwe. So yeah, number one, okay, corneas are too cloudy for goniotomy, so we can't do that. Uh, I would say in general, what do I do? Well, in general, In general, when I have cataract and glaucoma in a child, I prefer to do the lensectomy first. Now that doesn't necessarily apply to this question because the cornea is, has been stated to be cloudy. But if I have a clear cornea, glaucoma, and a cataract, I will take the lens out first and I'll just do that by itself. And because some of these small eyes and in infants 
or when you have an intumescent lens, okay, so the lens is really thick, um, or if you have a uh, abnormal eye, it's got PHPV or uh, uh, PFE, um, then by taking the lens out of there, you're getting it away from this pupil and you're eliminating any element of pupillary block or crowding the angles, shallowing the anterior chamber. And a lot of times pressures will improve just by getting the lens out, okay? So that's what I generally prefer to do. However, um, as stated in this question, the cornea is cloudy. Well, if the cornea is too cloudy to do a goniotomy, it may or may not be too cloudy to do a lensectomy. Not always. I mean, goniotomy takes a really clear cornea, whereas lensectomy you could probably get through with a slightly cloudy cornea. So two options here. One, you could just scrape the epithelium because that's generally where the cloudiness is unless this is a scarred cornea. And if they can scrape it and it's clear enough to do a lensectomy, or if it's just generally clear enough to do a lensectomy, I would still do that. Um, or then if, if it's just super cloudy, um, trabeculotomy. I like trabeculotomies anyway, um, because even a mildly cloudy cornea in these infants, you get them under the microscope light, it's really hard to see. Uh, for me, goniotomy is what I use in older kids who have glaucoma that clearly wasn't as severe. They, they may have uh, large clear corneas. Um, so, you know, you see a five-year-old with a clear cornea and um, in glaucoma. Goniotomy is a great um, first procedure for them. But when you have infants with glaucoma, with or without cataracts, a lot of times the cornea is really cloudy or it's partially cloudy and, and doing a goniotomy is, is difficult. So trabeculotomy, if you have to um, have one technique at your disposal, you can do on anyone. So I really like those. The only problem with trabeculotomy is that uh, if you have an abnormal eye like uh, PHPV um, or one that's really bufthalmic and stretched out, then finding Schlem's canal can be really tough. So, um, but if I had a cloudy cornea and a cataract um, and glaucoma, well, taking the cataract out right away is not really helpful because the cornea is cloudy. So you gotta get the cornea clear. So I would do a trabeculotomy, get the cornea clear, keep them on oral and topical pressure lowering agents. As soon as the cornea cleared, I would reassess um, and go ahead and do your lensectomy at that point because you can probably do a better job with it. So both of those conditions, the cataract and the glaucoma are amblyogenic. Um, so get the cornea clear first and then do the lensectomy, but do this all in a relatively compressed time period. It's, uh, would I do them all at the same time? Probably not. You know, that's just, each of these is complicated enough by itself, but doing them combined in an infant eye that's soft and has been opened, uh, you know, maybe you can do that. And, and maybe I would if, if there were anesthesia concerns or concerns that I wasn't going to get the patient back. Uh, but if I had good anesthesia and good access to the patient, I would do one at a time. Um, older kids, uh, I might do endolaser or uh, even maybe a, a tube shunt implant combined with cataract surgery, but that not in an infant so much. All right. Uh, okay. Our next question is from Syria, uh, Dr. Humeda. And um, this is a good question about, uh, this is from the live questions. Uh, this is about um, uh, prism eating phenomenon. When do you see it and how do you deal with it? Yeah, so most commonly, we talk about people eating up prism. You give them a, a correcting prism, and they adapt to it, and you still measure more prism on top of that. Um, at one time, uh, I used to do a lot of prism adaptation for refractive esotropia. And so, for example, someone would come in with uh, refractive or acquired non-refractive ET measuring 30 and you would give them a prism for 30, like a press on prism for 30. Send them home for a few weeks and have them come back. And then you would measure them 
and now they've got 30 prism on, but you're still measuring, say, another 15 or 20 of deviation. So now you up their prism another 15 or 20. So now they've got a 45 prism on and they come back after a couple of weeks. And even with that on, uh, now they're still measuring a residual 10. All right. Um, now, if they don't eat it up and they stabilize, then that is effective prism adaptation. And you will generally get slightly better results if you operate for that larger prism adapted deviation. However, when they just keep eating it up like that and it just keeps building and building, then you have a little bit of a dilemma as to what to do. And um, um, because they just keep eating it up. And in those cases, I, it gets a little confusing. And what I will do is uh, generally operate for um, their largest uh, non-prism adapted deviation, but maybe factor it up a little bit. And, you know, usually, usually you're talking about the difference of a half or one millimeter. These are not big differences. Um, I don't generally do uh, prisms for exotropia, and um, I don't generally do them with infantile isotropia. So usually it's kind of this acquired non-refractive or refractive isotropia. Um, uh, you do see it with adults who are getting prisms post-operatively. Uh, they, you know, they get partially corrected with surgery and then you give them prisms and, and um, then they come back and they need a little bit more. So having Fresnel press on prisms is nice for that, but admittedly Fresnel press on prisms cost about $50 US each. And uh, so we call it taking, them, taking the prism for a test drive before they go buy prism glasses. Uh, for us, at least, where prism eyeglasses might cost $400 US, uh, doing a test drive with a $50 Fresnel may be reasonable. But I think for most of us in developing countries, you, A, you're not going to have access to Fresnel prisms to do trials with. Um, so it's kind of not even a factor, perhaps. Um, so if they stabilize with prism and eat it up, um, I'll operate for that. Otherwise, I'll just kind of go a little more conservative. All right, back to, uh, we still have some previously submitted questions. So let me go back to those. Uh, this is one that comes up frequently when I give cataract lectures. What are the current indications for primary multifocal IOLs in pediatric cataract surgery? You know, this is something that just seems like it would be a great idea. Um, this is from Tunisia, this question. It seems like, yeah, P, uh, multifocal ILL is great for kids because then they have this expanded depth of field and should help them with amblyopia and vision development. Well, turns out it doesn't really work that way. Uh, you know, when you do a multifocal ILL, I'm not an adult cataract surgeon, but when you do a multifocal ILL in in an adult, it really needs to be precisely measured and, and they really need to have an accurate post-operative outcome because you need to get um, their distance correction, basically emetropia with your IOL. And then they have the multifocal characteristics of the IOL to give them some range of near. If you're gonna do that in a child who's still growing, it's not gonna work out because A, you don't know what they're going to be as an adult, so you can't target that. All you could measure and target would be is what they are right now. So going back to one of the earlier questions, a three-year-old or a five-year-old. All right, let's go with the five-year-old. You're gonna give them a multifocal IOL and you're gonna to have to target emetropia um, or something close to it. But that kid's still growing. So they, you may, if you can perfectly target emetropia now, you may have a brief period where it's working. But once they grow a little bit, now the distance is out of focus, so they need glasses for that. And also, you've lost any near benefit because if that multifocal IOL was giving you two diopters of accommodative ability or, or near vision ability, well, now they've grown and now it's off 
So now they don't even have that. They have two diopters of range, but it's somewhere in this intermediate range. It's not at near anymore. Uh, so it just doesn't work out. Um, the other thing is a multifocal IOL in a younger patient where you're still doing retinoscopy, it's really difficult to see the reflex. Uh, this is like doing retinoscopy through a distorted lens or a subluxated lens or a lens that has irregular astigmatism. Uh, you know, these are, these are tough to retinoscope through because you're getting the, the multiple refractions from uh, no matter what kind of multifocal IOL it is, okay? Um, so in general, they're just not a good option uh, for that, for those reasons. Uh, could you use it in an older teenager? Yeah, yeah, if you were confident that they were no longer shifting on a refractive standpoint and had seen that through a few um, office visits, then, then, then I think that's maybe one good application for a multifocal IOL in someone who's still a pediatric patient technically, okay? Um, but I think you wanna prove that the refractive air is not changing first. All right, uh, back to our live questions. And this is a good one uh, because this is something that I like to do. Uh, this is from Dr. Manda or Dr. Manda. And it is, do you encourage optic capture or just leave the optic in the bag in pediatric cataract surgery? Kind of depends on how the surgery's going and what I have to work with. Uh, pediatric cataract surgery, if the bag is in good shape and I can safely implant the lens completely in the bag, I do that. And I do not prolapse the optic um, through the posterior capsule. Okay, so the different, when you talk about optic capture, there are different ways to do this. You can have the haptics, the haptics in the bag, and the lens in the bag, right? Standard. Um, that's always my first choice. If you have the posterior capsule open, you have the option of prolapsing the optic through the posterior capsule um, and leaving the haptics in the bag. Now, why would you do that? Well, some people would like to do that because now when the lens cells uh, migrate in to the visual axis, they cannot get on the back side of the IOL. They could get on the front side still. Um, so I don't think you really gain anything. Um, now, I do, when I do optic capture, it's usually when I'm putting in a sulcus lens. So say I've had a complicated cataract surgery uh, it's had an abnormal posterior capsule, like a posterior lentiglobus, which would be very common that the capsule blows out while you're doing a surgery. Or, or you're doing a young child and you've, you've done an anterior capsulotomy and it just didn't go very well. It's too large or it's got a radial extension. Um, and I'm not confident in my ability to get it in the bag. Then I'll do a sulcus lens. And if I'm doing a sulcus lens, I'm not going to use a one-piece monoblock lens. So I love like um, the Alcon Acrosoft lenses, uh, but you wouldn't be using an SN or an SA type lens, right? They have the big, thick, solid um, haptics. You would want to use the one that has the thin three-piece haptics or have a thin one-piece non-folding lens or something similar where you're gonna put the haptics in the sulcus, and then you're gonna try and, you're going to uh, leave your anterior capsulotomy just small enough that the lens optic will go through, all right? So you're pushing your lens optic through, and now the optic is in the bag. And so you are using your bag position uh, calculations. Um, that keeps the optic away from the iris, so you're using sulcus fixation, but optic placement in the bag behind the anterior capsule so that you're keeping the lens back in a more normal position. You're not going to have problems with chafing on the iris back surface. You're also not going to have problems with um, a pupillary block. So that would be my number two preference. And then if, if that's just not possible, then I do complete sulcus placement. Um, and, and a lot of times that's just the best thing to do because uh, you're not wanting to disturb. Um, you go back on a secondary IOL uh, and you're not wanting to disturb the, the 
the existing Somerings ring in some cases. All right. Uh, and back to our previously submitted and previously submitted questions. We're past our time. I'm just going to keep going because I see we have a lot of live questions too. Let me see what we have left on the, on the previously submitted questions here. All right. This is a general question. I think it's a fair question. Uh, any any suggestions on how to increase cooperation when examining children with autism? This is from a doctor in the U.S. Um, well, I, you know, I think that anytime you're uh, dealing with a child with autism, you just have to bring your A game, right? You're doing the same thing you do with other kids to win their cooperation, um, but you just have to up it to the next level. You can't, the, the one thing with kids with and without autism, you really can't force them to do this stuff they have to be, have them on your side. So um, unless they're an infant that you can restrain, um, forget it. So what do I do? Um, I specifically, and a couple pointers here, um, um, you know, don't just like jump in and start your exam. And uh, do anything but medical stuff at first with kids with autism or other kids that are just afraid um, talk to them about something non-medical if you can engage them in conversation. Yeah, I like to talk to kids about things like uh, animals, food, dinosaurs, sharks, cartoon characters, all these things that uh, kids think are cool. If you can identify something that they think is cool and start talking to them about that, then you incorporate that into your examination and convince them that they want to look at what you want them to look at. Um, if you... If they're nonverbal, then um, then maybe I just make funny noises or use light up toys. Light up toys, these little LED light up toys that blink and make noise are great. Um, one thing with kids with autism specifically is be careful about making jokes or teasing them. Sometimes when you would tease around with them, they um, they get mad or they get offended or they get upset and. While I do that all the time with other kids, I find that um, I try not to do that with kids with autism. It ends up just getting them mad rather than uh, winning them over. Um, so, um, you know, I always have, I'm famous for my little Tigger toy, which I like to do um, because I can hold it in my mouth while I'm doing prism measurements, okay? Um, so I'll engage them when I'm doing things like motility um, or retinoscopy. retinoscopy, I can always put it there too. Um, but I'll try to get them to follow my toy. Um, and if, if I'm doing retinoscopy or indirect ophthalmoscopy, if I've identified that they like dinosaurs or sharks, you know, I'll say, hey, uh, look in the light. Um, tell me if you can see uh, the dinosaur. You know, just stuff like that. Okay, so these, these are all just um, upping our game of what we normally do as pediatric ophthalmologists. All right, live question. Uh, and this is uh, early stage for congenital cataract surgery in your practice, zero, two, or four weeks. Um, so earliest age for congenital cataract surgery. Depends on when you get them, right? I mean, it really boils down to that. Um, I really like to have their surgery done at around a month to six weeks of age because that gives me time to get their surgery done on one or both eyes and not only get their surgery done, but get them into um, optical correction if they need it. Because it doesn't do any good to take the cataract out and have them aphakic or out of focus. Um, uh, they're still gonna be amblyopic and develop nystagmus if that's the case. So you have to have the surgery done and you have to have them optically corrected before six to eight weeks of age before nystagmus sets in, okay? Um, so for me, um, I do them as soon as I can. Usually, usually you see, say, what's a common scenario here? Uh, red reflex gets picked up on pediatrician's examination before they're discharged from the hospital. So you're seeing them, they're about a, a week, week old. See them at a week old, maybe schedule their surgery to be when they're about four weeks old or three weeks old or five weeks old. All right. I would say that that's typical. 
Um, earliest age for me personally um, is I've done an infant IOL on someone who was born four weeks premature, but then I did the surgery on their due date. I guess that's technically zero. Um, that was 18 years ago. We got an intraocular lens. I just saw the kid. Uh, he's age 18 now. Saw him the other day, and he's 2060 in that unilateral infant IOL. So that's one of those success stories for infant IOLs, um, unilateral. And I still do infant IOLs, but not typically at that young age anymore, um, and typically not bilateral. Uh, and that's based on the results of the infant aphakia treatment study. But sometimes, sometimes it's still indicated. All right. Uh, so that's, that's the answer there. Uh, let, me, let me focus on our live questions here, since we have uh, everyone still online here. Um, another live question from uh, Syria, Dr. Hameda again. How do you diagnose... Uh, the dissociated horizontal deviation, DHDs, and do you, or you use reverse prism test or not? So um, two things here. One is uh, any kind of dissociated strabismus, whether it's a dissociated vertical deviation or dissociated horizontal deviation. Um, how do you diagnose them? Well, the simple answer to that, to just making the diagnosis, is what happens in the other eye? Okay, so you see a patient and they've got something going on vertically up or horizontally out, which is usually what we see, vertical or horizontal XT. All right, so you see that and you go, well, I wonder if that's a, a deviation, a regular deviation, or is that uh, a dissociated deviation? You gotta look at the other eye. So if this eye, if you're doing cover testing, back and forth, back and forth, this eye keeps going up, then this eye should be down, right? So if you, if you are going back and forth and only this eye is going up, then that's dissociated. If this eye is never hypotropic, then it's not, it's, this, is not, this is not a normal vertical deviation. This is a dissociated deviation. Um, same thing horizontally. You can be doing your cover testing one eye always looks like it goes out. The other eye never goes out. All right, it's just dun, 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 dun. Well, that's a dissociated horizontal deviation. Do I do reversing tests? No, I don't do reversing tests. Um, I, I can just tell from the alternate cover test and the cover uncover test. Problem is, how do you measure them? I don't think these things measure very well. You can try to measure with a prism and, um, and see what it takes for the eye not to refixate. So you get a vertical deviation. I'll put a prism on um, when it's deviated and then force it to take up fixation and see whether or not it still comes down. Uh, and that's one way to estimate uh, vertically or horizontally how much deviation you have. However, I don't, a lot of times I don't bother to do that because the, the surgical correction of DVD or DHD is not really measurement based. So if I have a, a DVD, I'm either going to do an anterior transposition of the inferior obliques if there's inferior oblique overaction, and that's pretty much one size fits all, or I'm going to do a um, five or eight millimeter superior rectus recession if there's no inferior oblique overaction. And how do I decide five or eight? Well, if the DVD is bilateral, then I do eight on both sides. If the DVD is unilateral or highly asymmetric, I do eight on the worst side and five on the left. Uh, same thing with horizontal deviations. You know, usually if you have a DHD uh, that's XT, which is what we tend to see, then, you know, usually that's just a maximum lateral rectus recession. It's, it's not something you measure and grade like you would for normal um, non-dissociated strabismus patterns. Now, you do have to be cautious because you can have a combined DVD with a true hypertropia. And in that case, you are measuring, and say this is the hypotropic eye, you, you measure with your prisms until you no longer see that hypotropia 
and all you're seeing is the vertical dissociated strabismus, and then you have to kind of uh, factor those two together. All right, that's that's really probably the only time I really bother to do prism measurements for dissociated strabismus is when it's combined with a true manifest hypertropia, and then I'll write down some estimate of both kinds. But I just kind of estimate uh, dissociated strabismus as you know it's basically small, medium, or large plus one, plus two, plus three, plus four. Okay, not, everyone may not agree with that, and some people like to measure it, but uh, I don't think it's clinically relevant based on the treatments. Uh, next live question. This is from Dr. Karasiova. And Dr. Karasiova's question is, um, what formula or recommendations do you use for resection, for resection and recession amounts calculation? Um, most of my training has been under people who trained with Marshall Parks. And so I would say that in general, my surgical dose calculations are derived from Marshall Parks tables. Um, but those tables generally don't go up into the higher numbers. So when you start getting into prism diopter measurements of 40 and 50 and 60, uh, they don't really go that high. Um, so I will um, use some of the other tables that are out there. Um, Von Norden has published tables. Uh, Ken Wright has published tables. Um, if you look at the CyberSite library, again, at the pediatric ophthalmology and strabismus modules. Uh, there are, under the um, basic strabismus, which is uh, module number two, I think it is, um, advanced strabismus is number four, there are surgical dose tables, commonly accepted surgical dose tables there, and, um, and that's what I'll, what I'll use. So you can, if you need those straight up, that's where you can look. All right. Uh, next question is from Dr. Bengoa. How do you manage recurrent chalasia uh, or chalasia and blepharitis in children? Yeah, this is always kind of a pain. Um, clearly, you know, if someone has a big, uh, nasty uh, chalasian, you want to do incision and curatage. But the question is, what do you do with the chronic ones or prevent recurrences? And I would say that our protocol now, uh, we've started doing a lot of flax seed oil supplementation. Uh, that works by um, thinning out the meibomian secretions so that people don't get the blockages leading to um, blepharitis and, and uh, chalasia. Uh, the dosing for the flaxseed supplementation, I don't have offhand. Um, we have a little handout we give out in the office. Um, but generally, you know, flaxseed either as the ground seed or as the oil is available in the um, uh, organic food stores, health food stores, or general markets. And people can take that a couple times a day as a supplement. Um, that's probably the biggest change, short of doing things that we've done for ages with uh, a baby shampoo, um, lid scrubs twice a day. And I'll, a lot of times use a rhythomycin ointment after they do the scrub. So have them put a rhythomycin ointment on the, on the lashes, on the lid margins. Uh, if someone has really bad um, blepharitis, and um, uh, I'll use oral erythromycin also. Um, uh, the other uh, similar medications, uh, macrolides, uh, Zithromax, I think um, can also be helpful, although I haven't had a great luck with that topically. But and, uh, so that's generally what I do. Um, next question from Dr. Aguela. We saw a three month old baby last week with abnormal head posture and nystagmus. Uh, it was a jerky type, jerk type nystagmus on the same right side, no other signs. Uh, we advise them to simply come back in one month, uh, should we have done better. So a three month old baby with a head posture and nystagmus, um, jerk type nystagmus. Um, if, no, I don't think there's any, um, I don't think there's any urgency with a three month old born with nystagmus. Um, what's it going to be from? Well, it's not acquired. You're not expecting this to be a neurologic lesion. So if the baby's otherwise normal, um, I don't do imaging for a, a newborn baby with nystagmus. But I'm looking for 
One is there a family history of nystagmus because a lot of times these are familial, just congenital motor nystagmus. I'm looking for, uh, as soon as I can get a close look at the iris, I'm looking for iris transillumination because uh, people with albinism will have pinpoint iris defects. And then the third thing, uh, especially in males, uh, you can have um, um, ocular or just ocular albinism. So again, looking for iris transillumination defects. And then um, that's generally, it's generally going to be one of those things. And then optic nerve hypoplasia. You want to get a really good look at the optic nerves to see if they are smaller than normal or perhaps less pink than normal. Um, if you do find that, then, um, then that is someone that uh, generally we would do neuroimaging with an MRI on, um, especially if it's bilateral. Um, uh, if it's unilateral, there's some debate about whether or not imaging. Um, you know, things with, so if they have head postures from nystagmus that mentioned that they had a right head posture, in the short term, there's really nothing to do. Um, if that head posture is constant over time or frequently manifest, particularly as they get closer to school age, then I'll start talking to families about nystagmus, null point surgeries. But I think first you want to make sure that the null point's not going to change. Um, that, um, that there aren't other ocular abnormalities accounting for this and um, before you make your decision on null point surgery. And there's plenty of time to do that. And the results aren't perfect, so there's no big hurry on this anyway. Okay. So, no, I think you did the right thing. I'd have done the same. Uh, next question, would you recommend, this is from, uh, from Cambodia, from Dr. Farah, uh, would you recommend ortho... Uh, Ortho K for your myopic cases, orthokeratology. Um, yeah, I'm not a big orthokeratology uh, fan. Um, I'm not opposed to it. I just don't know that it really um, um, provides that sustained benefit that you want. Um, maybe I shouldn't comment too much because I, I, I just don't have a lot of personal experience, but I, I, I would be curious if those I, I have no doubt that you can make some short-term changes in the curvature of the cornea and maybe in a really young child, uh, you could get some permanent changes, just like we see permanent changes from glaucoma, right? Can, that can change corneal characteristics. But after about, if you're just using cornea glaucoma, for an example, after about age four or five, you don't see permanent changes in the corneal size. So why would I expect to see permanent changes in the cornea with orthokeratology in someone older than age five? And I don't think I would. Um, I think as long as you're doing it, you probably get changes, but as soon as you stop, I suspect it regresses quite a bit. Um, so not big on that. And I think, I think for me, um, even, even low dose atropine, I'm, I'm kind of, the results of that, uh, there's some difference with low-dose atropine, but it's not like you're taking someone who's a plus seven and making them a, or a minus seven and making them a minus one. You might impact their myopia by a diopter or two from the studies I've seen and whether or not it's worth it. I, I think you have to uh, come to that decision on your own. For me personally, it's, it's kind of a non-event. Uh, I, I don't think doing atropine for five years to save a diopter of myopia or so is, is, is probably worth it. But to some families it would be. And in those cases, it's, it's fine. Uh, another anonymous question, which anti-glaucoma drugs are suitable for pediatric age group? Answers all of them. I, I use all of, all of the pediatric, or I'm sorry, I use all of the adult glaucoma drugs in the pediatric age group, but I do um, the one that I am, we should really make note of here is bromonidine or alpha -gam. Um, So this one is known for causing intense uh, somnolence, CNS depression in small or young children. So I would say anyone age five and under, uh, it's not an absolute contraindication, but I really try to avoid it. And if you do use it, you want to do it with punctual occlusion. But, but I've had several 
uh, kids in that age group up to five where they were on bromonidine and like the kids were so somnolent that the family couldn't even wake them up for 10 hours. So yeah, that's, that's problematic. Otherwise the other medications, so the beta blockers, if you can use a half percent reduced dose or a 0.25, uh, that's great. Um, but I've not seen any problems with beta blockers. I've not seen any problems with carbonic anhydrase inhibitors, whether they were topical or oral. Um, I've not seen any problems with uh, iopidine or the other alpha agonists. Um, the prostaglandin agents you can use, I've not been real impressed with them in children. They, 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 maybe they work in the older kids, but in, in young kids, I think the effect is pretty negligible. Uh, I'll use them as a supplement, but they're not my go-to. So the answer is anything, but whenever you can use a lower dose, use it. Whenever you can use punctal occlusion, use it. And I'm just talking about temporary manual punctal occlusion for four or five minutes until the drop, wipe away the excess. But the big one is bromonidine, which is alpha gain in the United States. Probably try to avoid that one in the young kids. All right. Uh, another question from Dr. Mustafa. And the question is, your protocol for using Botox for strabismus. Um, generally, um, when I use Botox for strabismus, it is most commonly in the setting of adult patients with acquired six nerve palsies. Probably 90% of the time when I use it, that's what I'm using it for. And I'm using it during the first few months of the palsy to try and prevent them from developing medial rectus contracture. And what I do is I give them five units into the medial rectus. Um, sometimes in the office, but um, frequently uh, in the outpatient surgical center with them just getting a, a mask induction um, for anesthesia. Um, I used to do it with EMG guidance and uh, I, I, I kind of stopped doing that. I, I didn't, I personally didn't think it made a big difference um, any more than I can get if I just have them a little sedated. I grab the medial rectus with some heavily toothed forceps and, uh, and guide the needle in. Other times when I use Botox for strabismus would be uh, to help augment a full tendon transposition when I'm doing definitive correction for a six nerve palsy or maybe a partial third nerve palsy. Um, then I'll put it in, in, in whatever tight muscle there is to help um, with my transposition. And then sometimes I will use it with acquired uh, non-refractive strabismus in either children or adults. So the acquired non-refractive ETs in particular, um, if I don't really know how it's going to evolve, um, I've used it in those cases. But um, honestly, the times I've done that, I've, I've had to eventually go back and do strabismus surgery. I haven't seen quite the lasting permanent effects that some people report. Um, I have tried it a few times for infantile esotropia, wasn't terribly impressed, and um, frankly, those kids have to be under anesthesia anyway. I didn't see much benefit to using Botox, which takes me five minutes under anesthesia versus doing a bilateral meter rectus recession, which takes me 20 minutes under anesthesia. So um, it's pretty limited and mostly for adults with paralytic strabismus. Um, next question is from Dr. Uh, Olosanya. Um, when is the best time to perform adjustment following adjustable strabismus surgery? All right, full disclaimer, I do not routinely do adjustables. I have done them in the past. I have not been too much in love with them. And so I stopped doing them more or less. It takes, it's very rare that I do an adjustable now. But, you know, look, the easiest time to adjust them is when you do it. And, but if you're going to do it on the table, um, in the surgical room, then you have to do their surgery under light sedation. So uh, this is propofol, perhaps, which is expensive. Um, but you, and especially in an older person, you can do the surgery, uh, especially if it's on one muscle that's easy to access, 
under propofol, and then they wake up really fast, and you can do the adjustment while they're on the table, okay? That's easiest, honestly. If you have to do multiple muscles, um, or if you have to don't have propofol, then you're looking at doing the adjustment next best, as far as I'm concerned, in the recovery room. So you let them wake up from their surgery, and um, but they're only out of surgery for say an hour. Say you do another case and you go do the surgery. And so they're waking up from the surgery, they're a little more alert, which is a concern, right? If you're doing adjustments on people that are still gorked out from their anesthesia, I'm not sure how reliable that's going to be. Um, also, if you've done a lot of surgery on them, multiple muscles, and they, their vision is all blurry, again, I'm not real sure how reliable um, their their ability to fixate and give you input while you're doing an uncomfortable adjustment on them is. So when I was doing adjustables, those are the two ways that I did them. And I didn't really like either way. I, I didn't feel that, um, I didn't feel like anyone benefited. I didn't feel like it made my outcomes any better. And I felt like the patients weren't necessarily able to give me really good input because they were uncomfortable and they were sedated, All right? The other way to do it is wait till everything wears off and do it the next day in the office. That has the benefit of now they don't have anesthesia on board. Maybe they can see a little more clearly. The downside is they are really uncomfortable when you adjust them in general. And, um, and the muscle starts to stick down where it was. And so making the adjustment is more difficult. So, and I, I haven't done those, but I've assisted on those 20 years ago when I was a fellow and um, I wasn't too taken with that either. So for what it's worth, that's my input. Next question from Dr. Sadu. What is the best management of accommodative spasm with, su with significant pseudomyopia in children? All right. This comes up once in a while. So accommodative spasm inducing myopia in children, fortunately is not super common, but um, the times that I've had the management, well, what do you have to do? Well, you, you have to break their accommodation. So usually that's a matter of putting them on atropine. So I put them on atropine. You can start off by trying to do this just for a few days. A lot of times a few days is not sufficient though, and you need to do this for uh, weeks or even months. And in that case, you're gonna wanna give them a bifocal, all right? Um, so you put them on atropine, you do an atropinized refraction so that you can correct their distance deviation and then give them a near add while you keep them on the atropine for several days or weeks. And once you've successfully broken the accommodative spasm, then go back um, to their, um, to their um, non psychopleased eyewear. But be, be careful to double check um, what, you know, that they didn't have myopia that's been over minus to begin with. So take a good look at your atropine refraction while you're doing that um, so that you can give them as low of a minus as possible. Okay, I think in kids that's always a good idea. And this is one of the reasons why we do cycloplegic refractions in kids uh, because they will either give you too much myopia subjectively or they'll give you not enough hyperopia on their responses subjectively. So cycloplegia is always important in kids. All right. Uh, next question is uh, from Siri again, Dr. Hameda. What do you do for exotropic dissociated horizontal deviation? If the patient has esotropia and a, and a XODHD, right? So this is an interesting situation. So they're actually showing esotropia when you measure them on alternate cover testing, but they are a, developing an exotropia DHD at times. What, what do you do? All right. And I see this not commonly, but I think I've seen it a few times. Um, well, I think you kind of have to decide what, which of those two things is the problem, all right? Well, what do I mean by that? I mean, if they have a large esotropia um, and that's the problem, or they have diplopia related to the esotropia, 
um, or cosmetically the esotropia is a problem, then you fix that. If they have, if their concern is not the small to moderate esotropia they have, but the exotropia that shows up cosmetically with the DHD, if that's their concern, then you do the lateral rectus recession just normally um, like you would. And that's usually the situation I see. They're not so worried about the esotropia and they're not having diplopia, but they've got ET when you measure them, but they're worried about the cosmetic XT from the DHD. All right. It's a lot of letters there. Um, and so usually I'm just doing normal surgery for their horizontal dissociated horizontal deviation. And that doesn't seem to make the esotropia worse. So a lot of what you decide to do is the conversation you have with them about, well, what's the problem in, in, from their standpoint? Um, and some of the add-on questions are where, do you do less recession of the medial rectus muscle? Mm, I, I would still do whatever medial rectus recession you needed um, to control their symptoms, okay? So if they are diplopic from the ET, you're going to operate for that. And the uh, other question was, do you use Fodden surgery for esotropic dissociated horizontal deviation? Um, and I will admit, I don't really, I don't really use Fodden's uh, or posterior fixation sutures for either dissociated horizontal or vertical deviations. Uh, I know some people do, but I, I don't have any personal experience to guide you on that. But I would think that that could be a consideration um, in this scenario that you're suggesting, uh, you do esotropic muscle surgery for the manifest ET and perhaps a, perhaps a posterior fixation suture on the lateral for the DHD if, if that's showing up. I'm not confident that that would work, but um, I think that's a, a possible scenario that some people would suggest. All right. Uh, next question, anonymous. Management on congenital third nerve palsy. Yeah, well, these suck. Uh, there's no good way to treat these. You know, uh, whether it's congenital third nerve or acquired third nerve, you have to deal with what you have. If you have a partial third nerve, then there's no fix, there's no set pattern for that. It could be anything, and you just have to do surgery that takes advantage of the muscles that are still working, okay? Um, if you have a total third nerve palsy, usually, especially if it's congenital, so, um, usually one of the, you can try recessing the lateral, but in my experience, just recessing the lateral in a total third nerve doesn't do anything because the lateral is still pulling on the, on the globe and they'll still be exotropic. So some people do extirpations of the lateral and I've tried that. I haven't been real impressed with that either. So you're, you're taking out a big piece of the lateral rectus and not hooking it back up to anything. Problem is what's left retracts scars on to the posterior tenons capsule and it still pulls the eye XT. So I think for me, usually the best treatment for these complete third nerve palsies is to fixate the lateral rectus to the lateral wall periosteum. And the concept here is you put a non-absorbable suture in the lateral rectus and you disinsert it just like you would normal strabismus surgery. But then instead of fixating it back to the sclera, you go laterally inside the orbital rim and you pass the needle through the periosteum and you tie the lateral rectus to the periosteum. Um, the thought, the concept here is now the lateral can contract all at once, but because it's hooked to the periosteum, it's not moving anything. Therefore, it cannot pull on the globe or on the periorbital tissues and move the eye. And that's going to give you the best chance to center the eye. You're going to lose that abduction, but at least the eye will be centered now so that there's some single binocular vision that's possible with a head posture. The only problem with that procedure is it's very difficult to do. Um, I do it not too infrequently, but having a curved needle that you can pass out in that space safely, it has to be a very short, tightly curved needle, a heavy needle. 
and, um, and having it be a, a non-absorbable suture, it's tough to find, um, even in countries with good resources, it's tough to find that needle. And in countries with limited resources, finding a suitable needle has been really difficult for me. Um, but something like a P2, super curved um, and stiff. And then you don't really, you can cut down through the conjunctiva, like you've done a limbal incision and uh, you can cut down through the conjunctiva and the perioral tissue to get to the periosteum. Um, a little spatula type retractor or Dermar retractor can help with that. But it's still very difficult to, to make that pass. Um, the visualization is not good. The space for the needle between the eye, between the globe and the wall is not good. Um, so it's technically a very challenging thing, but that's the best thing to do. And then you can combine that with a shortening and transposition of the superior oblique tendon, um, just to shift it nasally by the medial rectus. Uh, this procedure is also described in the, in the library modules on, uh, in CyberSight in the advanced strabismus section, which is module number four of the pediatric ophthalmology series. Um, so take a look at that. Uh, Describe how to do those two procedures. Uh, and the final thing you can do, which I'll do sometimes, is just do great big resections or plications of the medial rectus. But the, you know, the problem with using a dead muscle is you may get some initial correction to it, but it's going to stretch back out over time. Um, but, you know, options are limited. All right. Next question from Dr. Uh, Mirkovic. Um, coloboma, iris colobomas and refraction. Uh, so iris colobomas and refraction. Um, and sometimes these can have irregular astigmatism and some astigmatic refractive errors. In general, I try to ignore the coloboma, uh, if that makes any sense, uh, because the coloboma is giving you access to a part of the lens that you don't normally refract through. So when you're refracting someone with an iris coloboma or aniridia or anything like that, um, concentrate on the center of the lens, uh, the reflex in the center of the lens and just neutralize that rather than what's going on in the periphery of the lens. And that would be my comment on that. So center of the lens, concentrate on that. Um, look for um, astigmatism or um, an isometropic refractive errors. Okay. Um, next question uh, from Dr. Humeda in Syria. High astigmatism with small error in the axis with glasses can cause anomalous head posture question. Um, so the question is, can, can high astigmatism with, a, with um, error axis cause anomalous head postures? What are other refractive reasons that cause anomalous head postures? So I do see some kids with uh, refractive errors which seem to be causing anomalous head postures. Um, it doesn't completely make sense to me, uh, but uh, so I see it, but I don't quite understand it because if I have a refractive error that's causing a head posture, when I turn my head, I'm still looking through that same visual axis. My iris didn't move. So what's different between my refractive error here or here or here, unless Unless the head posture is enough to block out the central visual axis in some way, whether it's with the nose or the eyelids, whereby you would get a pinhole effect induced from the external ocular structures. If, you, if their head posture goes away with a pinhole occluder, then I would say, okay, that's from the refractive air. But I don't really understand how that happens otherwise because my visual axis is the same here here and here i see it in some kids with down syndrome uh, that have funky refractive errors and i've always thought well maybe it's just their latent nystagmus so always look for nystagmus as the reason rather than the refractive error and it could be latent nystagmus 
Or look when you're doing indirect ophthalmoscopy, when you have them magnified like that, either with an indirect ophthalmoscope or at the slit lamp with a condensing lens, you can see fine nystagmus that you don't perceive um, just normally. Just like sometimes people have strabismus that they look okay, and you do alternate cover testing, and you don't see the refixation, but then you do something like a Maddox rod and you measure that they've got four, four degrees of, uh, or four prism diopters of uh, strabismus. So, all right. Uh, next uh, question is uh, from Dr. Bengoa. What's your stepwise approach when you do cycloplegic refraction? Well, my population is mostly light complected. We, we have some African Americans and some immigrants that are dark complected, but most of our patients are complected like me. So they're very easy to cycloplege. Um, therefore, what we do is we give an anesthetic drop, proparacaine, so that two reasons. One, it burns less than cyclogel. Cyclogel burns like fire. Atropine doesn't burn, but cyclogel does. Uh, so we give, um, at, we give an anesthetic drop first, and it also increases penetration of the cycloplegic. So it has two benefits. And then we generally use 1% cyclogel and they just get one dose they go to the waiting room for 20 to 30 minutes and then they get refracted if i have someone who is very darkly complected we may dose them twice um, or we may use two percent cyclogel if people still don't dilate well we may send them home with atropine to come back on another day but i don't routinely do atropine refractions uh, for two reasons one uh, population is not darkly pigmented enough to need it Two, um, the onset takes about an hour before you can do refraction with atropine, and then it takes a day to wear off. So those are the main reasons why we don't use atropine, but it's clearly a better cycloplegic agent. Okay. Uh, next question from Dr. Celeste. How would you treat a one-year-old child with 30 prism diopters of exotropia and abducin nerve paresis from both sides? So 30 XT and a bilateral third nerve paresis. But if you're assuming that they have a total third nerve palsy on both eyes or a partial third nerve palsy on both eyes um, and 30 XT. So usually for 30 prism diopters, um, if I have, uh, um, and they're saying a six nerve palsy. So if you have a six nerve palsy, abducens nerve palsy, you're actually going to have esotropia, right? So the abducens, um, if you have a six, let me just break it down this way since I'm not clear from your question. If you have a six nerve palsy and 30 of esotropia on both sides, I would probably do a full tendon transposition of the superior and inferior rectus um, on one eye. And because that'll usually give me 30 prism diopters of correction. If I add a posterior fixation suture to that, that'll give me another 10 prism diopters. So that would correct about 40 prism diopters of esotropia. Uh, if I have a true bilateral six nerve palsy, usually their deviations will be larger. It'd be like 50 or 60, in which case, I would just go straight to doing bilateral full tendon transpositions. Um, and um, in, in this case, you may want to try, if it's a, a child with a third bilateral third nerve or bilateral six nerve palsy, you may want to try um, uh, Botox first if that's available. Now let's flip this around. Let's say you have bilateral 30 XT from third nerve palsies. Uh, if they have bilateral third nerve palsies, um, if you have muscles that are working, you work with those. So if there's some medial rectus function still, then um, recess the medial and resect the lateral. Problem gets to be when you don't, when you, um, um, it, it, you know, when you, it's just the total third nerve palsies where you have limited muscles to work with. That's, that's the problem. The partial ones, you can still do recess and resect um, as needed. 
Um, next question, Dr. Bengoa. And just FYI, we're coming up on two hours here. So I'm probably going to cut this off um, after these next two questions that I have lined up right here so that we're um, about to uh, wrap this up. Um, doctor, two questions, one from Dr. Bengoa and then the next one from Dr. Humeda. Dr. Bengoa's question is, how much plus do you add? Do you have any table in cycloplegic refraction? Um, so when you talk about how much plus do I add? Um, so with cycloplegic refraction, I add for me, for my working distance is three diopter. I subtract three diopters, if that's what you mean. Uh, if I'm giving plus uh, to like treat a high ACA ratio or a pseudo phacic patient, I will usually use plus 250 or plus three diopters in those circumstances. And, and let's say it's a high ACA ratio, then I'll decrease the plus as they start to outgrow the bifocal. But I'll usually go straight to a 250 or three uh, for both high ACA ratio and um, and for um, Sorry for pseudophagia. Um, in terms of working distance, if you have short arms, you have to um, subtract a little more working distance. All right, and then final question. Superior oblique palsy causes depression limitation in uh, adduction or is it unnecessary? So superior oblique palsy, does it cause depression limitation in adduction? Uh, the answer is no. I'm not surprised when I don't see that. I think a lot of times whether or not you see limitation of the superior oblique with superior oblique palsies or what we call superior oblique palsies, it depends on whether or not it's congenital or acquired. The congenital cases, really, um, I, I hate to call them superior oblique palsies. It's more like the superior oblique tendon is too long. The muscle works fine, but the tendon's too long, so they get superior oblique um, a little bit of under action, but you may not even see it on their exam. What we see is the inferior oblique over action, you know, right? They get plus one, plus two, plus three. And so that's what we see. Um, so no, I don't mind if I don't see superior oblique under action. Uh, the, uh, the acquired superior oblique palsies, that's when I start to see a minus one, minus two on the superior oblique. But it's never, you know, it's never like a minus three. It's kind of interesting how we just don't see that. So I make a note of it when I see it, but not required to make the diagnosis. Uh, more likely to see that in cases of Brown syndrome where the superior oblique underacts because it's uh, too tight. All right, let's, uh, let's wrap that up for today. I appreciate everyone's questions. We went through 31 questions live, and then I think we probably covered about 10 pre-recorded uh, over a couple hours. So you guys did a great job with your attendance and your participation. And let us know if you like this format, we will keep doing it.